Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Costandinides. Welcome to Barches. Um, I, I would like to say a few words about Barches if you've never uh, been with us before. Uh, Barches is essentially um, an indie webinar series where uh, it highlights some fresh, exciting work related to the histories of Cyprus in terms of um, cultural history, social history, and political history. So we're trying to really have capture the different um, new research that is going on. Um, so uh, each month, our editors are discussing the, with academics, with scholars and artists about their work. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, have these webinars to make sure that all of you can ask some questions to these academics. And uh, we welcome dialogue and uh, we try to welcome all people of different genders, identities, ethnicities, ages, um, you name it. And if you're interested to join our team, uh, make sure you send us a message on Facebook. Thank you very much. So over to Lambros. Over to Lazers. Oh, over to Lazers, my bad. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to this episode of the Bachtes Histories of Cyprus. My name is Loizos Kapsalis, and I'm one of the founding editors of the Bachtes. This evening, I am joined by Dr. Chris Valandis Kiriakou. Valandis is a historian of uh, Byzantine and post-Byzantine Cyprus and a fellow of the Bank of Cyprus Cultural Foundation. His most recent book is titled The Byzantine Warrior Hero, Cypriot Folk Songs as History and Myth, 1965 to 1571. Songs tell stories, he writes, and have their own stories. This evening, I ask Valandis how historians can use folk songs to gain a better understanding of Cypriot society, politics, and culture during the transition from Byzantine to Latin rule. Together, we go in search of the Byzantine warrior hero, a figure of superhuman strength who sets out to defeat Saracen armies, slay mythical monsters, and even fight death himself. Valandi, hi. It's, uh, we met uh, a very long time ago. We go way back. It's such a pleasure to have you here tonight uh, in the Bachches. Um, Thank you, Loiso. Thank you for uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you uh, and talk about uh, my book and uh, about uh, the Byzantine warrior hero. And I'm also very happy to see me in, in the participants, uh, Vlada Stankovic. Vlada is um, the um, serious editor. Um, Hello, Vlada. He's a professor of Byzantine studies at Belgrade and director of uh, the Center for Cypriot Studies uh, of the University of Belgrade. Um, Vlada is the series editor at Lexicon Books uh, covering the uh, Byzantine uh, period. Um, very happy uh, to be with us today. Um, Andy, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, let's start by listening to one of the songs that you have sort of collected and uh, wrote about in your in your book. How about that? Okay. Can you share an, uh, an, an excerpt that you kind of find particularly meaningful and um, let's talk about it after. Okay. Um, I will begin with uh, one of the uh, earliest uh, recorded songs, uh, that of um, the hero uh, Theophilactos, Theophilact. Um, it was recorded, uh, it was written down um, in the late 19th century by Athanasios Sakellarios, uh, who visited Cyprus and um, uh, composed two volumes of um, uh, folklorist material from the island. Ο Βασιλέας Αλέξανδρος, Αλεξανδροπολίτης, έκαμε μίαν γιορτήν μικρήν και μίαν γιορτήν μεγάλη, έκαμε μίαν τα αιγιορκού και μίαν του αι μάμα, εκάλεσεν τους άρκοντες, τσούλον τα αρκοντολόι, τραπέζιν εμπουέβαλεν και κάτσα συνναφάσι. Και απολοάται ο βασιλιάς, τούτον τον λόν λέει, Κι ως πάει πέρα στο Περόν, στο Μέγα Σουλτανίκη, να πάρει τούτον το χαρτί, να φέρει αντιχάρτη, να κάνει δίκαιο πόλεμο, να φκαγουθεί στον κόσμο. 
και εκεί είχαμε θεοφύλακτος αρκόθιν και θυμόθιν, κλωτσάν τη τάβλα έδωκε στα πόθια του ευρέθη. Ούλα για μένα τα λαλεί, ούλα για μένα τα λέει, και φέρτε μου τον μαύρο μου, τον πετροκαταλήτη, που καταγεί τα σύρα και πίνει τον αφρίτη. Όπου πατά τα μάρμαρα, και κουρνιαχτού ευκάλλει, και φέρτε το σπαθάκι μου, το περευλογημένο, ώθε να μπει στον πόλεμο, φκένι ματσελωμένο. Φέρτε μου το κοντάρι μου, που να είσαι Γιώργη πάνω, φέρτε μου το ματσούτσι μου, που να είσαι μάμα πάνω, πια, και καβαλίζεψε τον πέρκαλον τον μαύρο, κι ώστε να πίεσαι τελιά, επίεσαι για μίγια, κι ώστε να πούσει το καλό, επίεσαι άλλα σίγια. Τερνιστηρκάν το μαύρο του και μπαίνει στο φουσάτο. Τες νάρκες νάκρες έπιανε και οι μέσες καταγιούντα. Τες μέσες μέσες έπιανε <coughs> και οι νάκρες ελιένε. Παγιώνει τρία μερόνυχτα, παγιώνει τρεις ημέρες. Ο μαύρος του προστάθηκε και ο τσίνος ευαρέθη. And here is the translation. <coughs> King Vasileas Alexander from Alexander City held a small feast and a great feast, one for St. George and one for St. Mamas. He invited the nobles and all nobility. He set a table and they sat to eat. And the king says this word, who shall go to Pirun to the great sultanate to take this letter and bring back reply? Who shall fight in just war and gain fame in the world? At that moment, Theophilac became full of anger and rage. He kicked the table and stood on his feet. Everything you say is for me, for me is everything you say. And bring my black steed, the stone breaker, the iron breaker, the foam drinker, who steps on a marble floor and raises no cloud of dust. And bring my dear sword, the most blessed, which goes into battle and comes out red in blood. Bring my lance, decorated with St. George, bring my maize, decorated with St. Mamas. In jumps and mounts, the most beautiful black steed, a thousand miles he rode before saying farewell, a thousand more he rode before they replied goodbye. He spares his horse and penetrates into the enemy army. He cut down their flanks, their center was extinguished. He cut down their center, their flanks were extinguished. For three days and nights, he was fighting. He was fighting for three days. His black steed became tired and he was bored. So, a, uh, a hero of superhuman stature and his superhuman strength that goes against uh, whole armies and uh, defeats the, uh, the, uh, the enemies until he is bored. Um, who composes these um, these songs that you study? Um, what is the context in which they are produced and shared? Um, well, these are folk songs, uh, which means that they were composed by anonymous singers, um, anonymous composers, uh, who were members of uh, probably of uh, the, the lower uh, social strata. Um, the, uh, we, we, have, we have no um, exact uh, chronology about the composition of these songs, um, but um, the language in which they were written back in the late 19th century uh, and the early 20th century by ethnologists and folklorists uh, who traveled uh, usually from uh, Greece to Cyprus to record um, these songs and folk tales and so forth, uh, is the Greek Cypriot dialect. Um, uh, the, the Greek Cypriot dialect, as it was spoken in uh, the late 19th century and the early 20th century. But uh, the thing with, uh, with language is that language is, is only a shell, an external, uh, an external thing that changes uh, as uh, the time moves on. What stays more or less the same, um, exactly because it is uh, more difficult to change, is uh, the narrative. 
This narrative uh, consists of uh, themes um, and symbols. Um, this narrative frame, framework, uh, for example, you have a hero who uh, sets out for a journey and he meets uh, a monster, he kills a monster and he, he becomes king. Um, this is called uh, a myth, a uh, mythos. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, a rep repetition of uh, more or less the same uh, types of myth um, from um, in almost all heroic folk songs from Cyprus. Uh, and this is important because uh, by analyzing the particular details of the, of the myth, uh, which seem to uh, contain traces, elements of historicity, uh, we can go back and see uh, how these uh, later recorded uh, folk songs uh, can tell us something about uh, the me medieval society of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the song um, uh, of Theo Theophilactos, uh, we have a reference to uh, the Sultanate of Pirun. The Sultanate of Pirun, um, uh, ancient Greek Peri, uh, modern uh, Orenli, if I pronounce it correctly, in, in Turkey, uh, existed in the 12th century. It was one of the Seljuk uh, um, Emirates. It was not a Sultanate, it was a, an Emirate. Um, created after uh, the migration conquest of uh, part of the, the Asia Minor by, uh, by the Seljuks. Uh, so this, uh, this is an element that uh, can help us date these historical memories that are transferred, uh, transformed and adapted uh, into, uh, into, into these songs by the peasant society of Cyprus. I mean, I understand that these songs have a history of um, maybe uh, 800, 900 years. How are they, how do they survive through time? How, who, um, who shares them and how are they, how are they, uh, uh, how do they survive through time? Uh, well, they do not, um, they do not change as monolithic uh, cultural artifacts that um, stay the same without, uh, mm. uh, without transformation. Mm. Uh, they survive exactly because uh, they are adapted into particular circumstances, uh, but uh, there is a basic um, structure that remains the same. This basic structure that remains more or less the same is uh, the narrative the myth. Mm -hmm. So the language can change. Mm -hmm. uh, words that no longer um, no longer have a meaning for the people uh, mm -hmm. are uh, set aside, new, uh, new words are added, um, but uh, the, uh, the story, the plot line um, more or less remain the same. Mm -hmm. And where the plot line changes, this is important because it means that uh, the singer uh, of the song uh, makes a choice uh, that could be meaningful for the mentalities of the peasant community uh, he or she represents. So how do you encounter these songs? Where do you come into their sort of story, their kind of arc? Well, I guess... <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, if you're a Byzantinist and you are working on Cyprus, uh, sooner or later you will come across this uh, <laughs> this body of songs. Um, and uh, the question is whether uh, someone will ignore them, as has done the majority of uh, Byzantinists working on, on Cyprus. Um, as something outside the canon of uh, primary sources consulted and analyzed by historians, 
or you will try to see how uh, they provide a different view about uh, the medieval and post-medieval society of Cyprus, namely about the peasant communities creating or uh, preserving and um, adapting these songs. Tell me a little bit more about that, because in, in your book, you are also very explicit about wanting to write a history, a kind of history that is different from most histories. You, you talk about a history from, from below. And what, what can these songs contribute to the writing of a history that is different from whatever is out there already? Yes, there is this concept of um, the history from below, um, which has been uh, formulated by Marxist historiography, especially Eric Hobsbawm. Um, usually in history, especially in Byzantine history, um, history is written uh, from uh, by, by the by the elites, so by, by the dominant um, social layers, uh, the subaltern, the the oppressed, the marginalized, uh, they do not usually have a voice. Sometimes they do, but uh, usually they don't. So these folk songs open up a window into uh, the systems, uh, the, the, the system of values, um, the uh, expectations, uh, the fears, the anxieties uh, of uh, low level people. And uh, in that way, they help, they help us understand how um, uh, history uh, could reflect um, the uh, realities of uh, lower society, of peasant society. I'm fascinated by, first of all, I've, I, I keep repeating this phrase, um, songs tell stories and have their own stories, but also in your title, you speak about history and myth. So these, these songs bring together um, elements that are more uh, historical in the sense that they record events that uh, we we know happened others we obviously know that can't have happened um, heroes killing giant crabs for example um, so how does a historian go about uh, working with these songs that uh, bring these two elements together you also uh, describe the process as a kind of um, peeling back um, uh, cultural layers or um, layers of cultural vestments you you describe it in your in your book can you tell me a little bit about how you you go about uh, working with these songs as a as a historian uh, let's see an example and i i, I shall comment on it uh, yes. uh, it's, it's only a couple of verses There is um, there is a fortress in uh, southern Asia Minor uh, called Anemurium. Uh, I think in Turkish is the same Anamur, uh, something like that. Um, so Anemurium. Um, is very close uh, linguistically to uh, Amorion, a city, uh, a town in Phrygia, which was uh, sacked by an Arab army in 838. And we have uh, the song of um, Amoris. Uh, Amoris uh, is uh, this hero associated with Amorion and uh, avenging the sack of Amorion and uh, the uh, captivity of his father in the hands of, uh, of the Saracens. Uh, and this song is very, uh, very popular in um, 
from various uh, Greek areas. Uh, but in Cyprus, we have uh, a song which is similar to the song of uh, Armouris. We have a hero uh, setting out to avenge the uh, captivity of his father, but there is no reference in the song to um, Amorion, but to Anemurion. So the, the beginning of the song, of the Cypriot song, goes like that. Paphutis e kursepsa sin ifrangi tanemurion. Kursepsan chores ce vuna, kursepsan monastilia, kursepsan ce ton anjulin, ce pirandon, ce pia. When the Franks sacked Anemurion, a city in southern uh, Asia Minor, they plundered castles and mountains, they looked at monasteries, they captured Anjulis and took him and left. What is striking is that uh, there is a reference to uh, the sack of Anemurion by a Frankish army, which is a historical event taking place in 1363 by a Frankish uh, military force um, uh, attacking from Cyprus. Uh, but uh, the, the, the myth, the plot line uh, of, of the song is that of uh, a similar song uh, relating uh, the, uh, the, the war between Arabs and, and Byzantines. So uh, the singer takes the plot line and in a way creates a, a separate version of it in which uh, the bad guys are the Latins who attack Anemurion and they even sack uh, monasteries. So this is a kind of adaptation uh, of, uh, of this adaptation process, ongoing adaptation process um, in the songs uh, and tells us something about how uh, the Greeks of Cyprus, they, they called themselves uh, Romain, uh, they were Orthodox, they, um, they belonged uh, religiously and culturally to uh, the Romania, uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, which was the medieval Roman Empire. Uh, it tells us something about how these people uh, saw uh, the Latins. They did not necessarily uh, They, they were not necessarily hostile to them, but this also shows that they, they did not necessarily accept them as part of their own community. Uh, the Latins were the main Christian other uh, in Cyprus. So um, yes, we, uh, we have adaptation, we have toponyms that will echo more uh, familiar, to, um, to an audience in Cyprus, we have a reference to a specific historical event, which is uh, also attested by um, uh, independent uh, sources like the Chronicle of Leondios Majeras. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if uh, I, I have answered your question uh, through this yes. example. I mean, it is, is, it is, a, is um it's a complicated process of uh, figuring out uh, what the the historical kind of context in which these songs uh, emerge, figuring out what the process of representing that um, event uh, uh, through kind of the lenses of, of a society on Cyprus uh, at the time, as, as well as separating out the kind of more mythical elements that have a longer lifetime. And we will talk about the kind of uh, mythical lifetime of, of these, these songs. The, some of the, the myths kind of predate Christianity even on the, on the island, as you, as you kind of say. So the historian comes in in a very kind of forensic way to, to separate out all of these elements, dig through the, the, the layers that are added through time. To analyze and, and, and scrutinize uh, tiny details in the mm. stromatography of 
uh, in this multi-layer um, structure of, of of the songs. So if we think about the the kind of world out of which these songs emerge, um, what is? I mean, it it sounds like it's a very brutal world of um, contest and war and um, political struggle. Um, what do we know about this period in which these songs emerge? Well, uh, the uh, this process of uh, adopting and adapting these these themes. Um, begins around the middle of the 10th century. Uh, so I, I should state beforehand that uh, these heroic folk traditions were initially developed in the eastern frontier of uh, Asia Minor, uh, near the Accra. The Accra was uh, the, uh, the frontier zone and uh, the, the troops guarding the Accra um, against the Arabs were the so-called uh, Akrite. Uh, the Akrite were uh, either professional troops or militias or uh, irregulars. So you have uh, warlords uh, uh, who gain fame by uh, fighting against the Arabs and sometimes by fighting each other. Um, and uh, they, uh, they have uh, legends and uh, songs sung uh, to praise their deeds. Uh, so in uh, 1071, we have uh, the Battle of uh, Manzikert, uh, Seltzug army uh, uh, captures uh, the Byzantine emperor, uh, Romanos Diogenes. Um, this is followed by a civil war and uh, the Seljuks uh, man managed to uh, conquer uh, most of the Asia Minor. And there is a wave of uh, refugees uh, traveling uh, to the Western parts of the empire, but also uh, to Cyprus. And one assumption is that these traditions about warrior heroes fighting uh, against uh, the Arabs, the, the Saracens, uh, came to Cyprus uh, exactly in this period. So uh, around the end of the 11th century, uh, the beginning of the 12th century. Uh, this was also a period of um, increasing militarization in Cyprus. Uh, so we have a new dynasty, dynasty of uh, warrior aristocrats, uh, originating from Paphlagonia, the Komnini. Um, so uh, the, the Komnini uh, understand that Cyprus is very important uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they build castles, the fortresses of the Pendadactylos range. Uh, they bring um, elite troops like the Athanati or part of the Scandinavian uh, Varangians in Paphos, uh, so Vikings in Paphos. Um, uh, and uh, there is this increasing obsession of uh, the ad administration of Cyprus with, uh, with war and uh, the warrior ethos, mm. uh, which was something uh, more general. As, uh, as a mentality uh, in the empire at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and what I argue in the book is that the songs were uh, further developed uh, during this period around the circle of the men governing Cyprus, uh, who had been fighting against the Arabs and uh, the Turks uh, in Asia Minor and Syria and so forth. In 1191, uh, we have uh, the Crusaders conquering, conquering Cyprus. So uh, this is followed by the establishment of uh, the Lusignan dynasty. The Lusignans are uh, Franks. They come from Poitou. Uh, they had been ruling uh, the kingdom of, of Jerusalem. And Cyprus becomes um, the kingdom of Jerusalem. 
uh, is transferred to Cyprus when uh, Saladin uh, conquers Jerusalem. So we have this further establishment of a, a, chivalric, uh, a chivalric elite, a chivalric uh, warrior class in Cyprus. But the difference is that now this um, new chivalric elite, although it has many similarities in the warrior ethos, um, Christian morals, uh, uh, economic status, high economic status with the former Byzantine elite, warrior elite, um, uh, this new elite is Latin Christian. So it's religiously and culturally different from uh, the majority of the population um, of the island. Uh, so there is a gap, there is a gap here. Um, although the, uh, the warrior ethos of uh, the Franks, Latin Christians, largely overlaps with that of uh, the Byzantine military aristocracy. And uh, the last century uh, of Latin Christian uh, hegemony in Cyprus is that of the Venetian uh, administration, which largely maintains uh, uh, the Lusignan um, warrior ethos. Uh, so this is the world of, um, uh, in which these songs were developed. Mm -hmm. So if you're a peasant uh, or not a peasant, <laughs> and you live in Cyprus uh, between the middle of the 10th century and uh, the late 16th century, you have to face uh, a variety of challenges. Uh, you have to face uh, oppression uh, from the aristocracy, uh, the state. Uh, you have to face uh, natural disasters affecting agriculture. You have to face uh, piracy, you have to face war. So this is, you have to face bandits. So this is violence in many different uh, forms. And uh, this is reflected in the, in the folk songs. Uh, the folk songs are, are, are filled with uh, various expressions of, uh, of violence. I mean, this is uh, this fascinating because when we think of Cyprus in the way um, uh, the, the kind of the island of Aphrodite kind of representation of Cyprus, this is such a fascinating um, difference in, in kind of the, the, uh, what happens on the island and what kind of uh, culture you, you call this, you know, a warrior culture that um, that emerges on the on the island, which is not necessarily something we we kind of think about when we uh, talk about the the island or the, the its inhabitants nowadays. Then don't tell the Cyprus tourist <laughs> organization. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, even uh, the goddess we now um, call Aphrodite, she was called Anasa, queen, uh, or even goddess in Cyprus, in antiquity. Uh, she, she, she covered all aspects of, uh, mm. of everyday life, mm. from uh, fertility, birth, childbirth, where marriages to, to war. She was mm. also a goddess of war. Uh, and in Paphos, archeologists uh, found a statue of uh, Aphrodite holding a spear. Uh, I think there is a, a, a profound <laughs> psychological explanation about this close connection of between uh, love and <laughs> Love and love and death, uh, and also a profound theological explanation about this. I mean, uh, if 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 we if we repress the fear of death, uh, seeking uh, pleasure, all kinds of pleasure to avoid uh, avoid death and avoid thinking of death, ultimately uh, death, which is a reality will come after us. <laughs> um, 
you can run, but you can't hide. Yes. Uh, not even the mighty Viennese uh, exactly. <laughs> could, not, could not escape. <laughs> Uh, Haros. Um, just to go back to the kind of um, society in which these these songs kind of emerge, and also the culture, which is a warrior culture, uh, and you describe it as a kind of elite warrior culture, culture at the same time. Um, however, the songs are actually produced from the bottom, uh, kind of up. Uh, uh, and so it, it, uh, there is a question there about whether um, the mass of the population identifies with this culture, this warrior culture of the elite. Let me add a detail about the relation, uh, the relationship between peasant societies and, 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 and war. Uh, some time ago, I read a book by uh, Dimitris Pavlidis, um, who uh, uh, his book was about the warrior dances of, uh, of Cyprus. And uh, he mentions uh, Isichios. Isichios was a, an early Byzantine lexicographer. And um, in his dictionary, he has, uh, he refers to uh, Kipria uh, Pali. This is Cypriot wrestling, and mentioning that uh, the Cypriots uh, had developed uh, a kind of I don't know street fighting, um, which <laughs> which took place outside the official athletic. Um, uh, space, uh, the gymnasium. Um, and this is very interesting because uh, it, it, it implies uh, that uh, there was a kind of local tradition or in uh, the peasant community um, related to, uh, to fighting. Uh, so yes, uh, we have this is a very interesting question uh, about uh, how, to what extent did uh, the lower population um, identify themselves with uh, the songs. It brings us to um, uh, the relationship between the mythical hero and uh, authority. Mm -hmm. So we have two, roughly two groups of, uh, of songs. In the first group, um, there is mutual um, collaboration and mutual support between state authority, uh, the king, the emperor, um, aristocrats, and uh, the hero. And uh, what the song, uh, what these songs describe is um, the, um, the killing of, of, of monsters. Monsters are the uh, the embodiment of the violation of natural law. They, um, uh, they threaten uh, the community. Uh, they, they, uh, they distort the established order, taxes. And taxes, the, uh, the concept of tax order was very important uh, in the Byzantine Empire. Um, uh, there was this uh, widespread belief that, uh, widespread ideology that uh, the, the hierarchy of, uh, of the empire is a reflection of the heavenly uh, hierarchy, uh, the divine world. Uh, so the king, the emperor, commissions the hero to fight the monster uh, for the sake of the community. Uh, so uh, the king sends uh, Costandaz, the Yanis, to find a, a giant crab. Uh, like uh, Hercules uh, and, and uh, to save community. But there is also another category of songs in which uh, the relationship between the king, uh, central authority, state authority, and the hero is not so harmonious. The hero is usually uh, a peasant, um, a marginalized figure, um, sometimes he's of mixed uh, descent, 
uh, he uh, he might be the son of a Jewish woman, and uh, there is no reference to the father, uh, which is interesting in, uh, in, in a male-dominated society. Um, he uh, befriends and collaborates uh, with gypsies uh, who are at the margins of society. Um, uh, he faces uh, he faces injustice, and this is a key uh, theme in this group of songs. And um, the hero, whose ego is uh, in a way overdeveloped, so he does not fight for his community. He does not fight for his em emperor, for his king. He fights only for himself, and he fights for himself because he uh, or his clan. Uh, to defend his family, to defend his clan, uh, because he considers that uh, he, uh, he has been the victim of uh, injustice. So there is this primitive, in a way, revolt against, uh, primitive, primitive rebellion against uh, Adikia, against injustice. In this way, in, in this way excuse me, uh, in, in this way, we see how the peasant communities uh through their songs um found the opportunity to um express their um frustration their anger uh, their symbolic resistance against mm -hmm. uh, against oppression so i would say answering to your initial question uh which I had almost forgotten uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> the, uh, the communities produ producing these songs in a way uh, identified themselves with both, uh, with both groups, uh, with both uh, categories. Uh, they, they both accepted uh, royal or imperial authority as uh, legal, as sanctioned by God, as just. And at the same time, when um, the historical circumstances changed, they, they, they resisted oppression, they resisted Adikia. Mm. You, talk, you, talk, you um, talk about heroes, you borrow the term from Michael, Michael Herzfeld, um, social borderers. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, point that you, you've, I mean, you've already spoken about um, sort of the, the, the kind of descent of the hero um, from uh, a Jewish mother or his association with uh, particular groups that were on the, on the margins. And I, I was wondering what the significance of this is in relation to the, the function the hero serves in these songs? Is it meant to uh, make the hero someone that people can identify with? Yes, I, I, think, uh, I think this is the answer. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're oppressed, if you don't have a voice, if you, uh, if you pay taxes and uh, fall victim uh, to uh, every kind of injustice, then you try to, humil to humiliate symbolically through the songs, to humiliate um, authority in every way. And the best way to do so is to be, uh, is to identify with a hero who is uh, as marginal as he can possibly be. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you you make another important point um, that uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that society was accepting of these um, marginal figures, of these marginal groups. Uh, there is this very interesting kind of uh, idea that uh, there are insiders and outsiders, um, but at the same time, uh, anyone can be an outsider at the same time as being an insider. Can you talk a little bit more about that um, that idea? Yes, I mean, um, uh, let's take the uh, the hero Porphyris. 
mm -hmm. example. Porfiris is uh, is a swine herd. His mother is uh, is a Jew. Um, he has a huge body. He's hungry all the time. Um, he's he's very poor and proud. Uh, so he's not a, a typical peasant. Uh, he's in a slightly uh, lower status than uh, the average peasant. Um, and uh, he declares that uh, he's not afraid of anyone and um, he can humiliate uh, the nobility. And so uh, uh, a huge army comes to arrest him uh, which is led by um, nobles uh, whose family, uh, whose, whose names are those of um, important Byzantine aristocratic families. Um, at first, Porfiris um, receives them, he offers his hospitality, um, and this is described by Gisonier as a, a Christ figure. Uh, he behaves uh in a humble way in a simple way uh accepting them giving them uh with generosity uh, feeding them uh, giving them water to drink but then he uh, falls big victim to to injustice uh he uh his hands are tied uh he's taken prisoner and um this christ figure which um, could be used uh, to, which appeals to, to, to anyone uh, because of the humility, simplicity, and so forth, uh, transforms into a fero ferocious, uh, savage uh, warrior hero. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and his persecutors are lost uh, in a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there is this combination of proximity uh, to the other and um, alternity at the same time. Um, so the hero can be uh, a true hero, but he can also be an anti-hero. And both, both aspects are dimensions of, uh, uh, I don't know, of the deepest uh, layers of the human psyche. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this uh, transformation of the hero. And in a different conversation that we had, I said that this uh, kind of survives in sort of uh, folk songs or to, um, uh, the writing of uh, authors up until the kind of 19th century. Uh, what is the significance of this transformation from the, the kind of Christ figure to the, the furious warrior, the, the brutal kind of cut your nose off, cut your ears off, um, split you in, in two kind of um, hero whose fury is kind of burning and um, directed at anyone and everyone. Well, th this is a theme going back to, uh, to the Iliad, in the, the Homeric uh, Lisa, uh, this wolfish rage, uh, um, Mircea Eliade, um, who has studied uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, the sociology of religion, uh, this subject um, argues that this savagery uh, was a way, uh, was perceived as a way in the rituals, and this is another important uh, dimension of, of the songs, their ritual uh, use, um, uh, that could bring uh, the participants uh, performing, uh, in a way, this rage uh, in union with the divine. But we also know uh, that um, the medieval period was, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in Cyprus, was, uh, was a violent wor world it was very violent. I mean, if you read about the Byzantine reconquest of Crete or uh, the wars between Byzantium and uh, the Arabs in Cilicia, uh, the Ottoman conquest of Cyprus, 
there are scenes of uh, unspeakable brutality, uh, which must have uh, shaped uh, the impressions and uh, imagination of um, of the people. One last question before I uh, before I open uh, the floor to to the audience for questions, and I, I it's related to what you just kind of uh, described, and this is the the very well known struggle between the figure of um, the ultimate kind of hero, the Yanis, uh, who fights uh, the personification of death, uh, and I was wondering if you could. Uh, sort of talk a little bit about the significance of this struggle between the Yanis and death. And I understand that you bring a very different interpretation of this, um, of this struggle in your, in, uh, through your work. In, in, in the separate versions of uh, the death of, of the Yanis, in which the Yanis fights the personification of death, uh, who is a figure associated with um, Saint Michael, the angel of death, um, the ancient god uh, Thanatos, ancient Haron, and so forth. Uh, in the Cypriot versions of these songs, um, there is so much emphasis placed on the element of injustice. So the Yanis uh, is mortal, he should die because this is God's will, God sends uh, Haros to take him, uh, but the Yanis resists. And when the Yanis defeats Haros in uh, the wrestling con contest, um, Haros asks uh, divine help to uh, kill the Yanis. And so what comes out of, from, from the song is that uh, God is responsible from, for uh, the Yanis' death which is a strikingly unorthodox <laughs> from a theological point of view <laughs> um, interpretation of uh, the sufferings of, uh, of human life. Um, and this, this shows us that the Christianization of society, which is usually considered at, as, 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 as an event, uh, is more like a process, a long process long-term process um, and apart from that we have um, a visualization of this struggle between a hero or a divine divine figure and uh, and death that might have inspired uh, Cypriot um, uh, narratives on the Harobalema the wrestling the fight the struggle against uh, Haros and this ritual uh, which continues uh, in, in the Orthodox uh, tradition to this day is uh, the so-called um, lift up the gates custom, which take, takes place every uh, Holy Saturday night, um, just after the reading of uh, the resurrection gospel. So the priest uh, performs a role. He, uh, he represents uh, Christ entering uh, the kingdom of, uh, of death uh, and descending into Hades. Um, so the priest knocks um, on the door of the church and he violently enters inside, um, representing the way Christ, uh, Christ in the Orthodox tradition uh, is Yahweh of, uh, of the Jewish tradition, uh, who is very often uh, represented as a warrior king, a divine warrior king. So Christ, the warrior king, enters into uh, the kingdom of death and defeats, uh, defeats death in a wrestling contest. So these different perceptions, one orthodox and one unorthodox, uh, merge together into uh, the Cypriot version of um, the fight between uh, the Yanis and, um, and Haros. And spoiler, 
uh, the Yanis eventually <laughs> loses <laughs> loses the fight. Well, I have so much to ask you, but uh, I think it's time to go to questions from the from the audience. Uh, there is already a question from Elada who just left. Uh, so maybe if I ask on her behalf, she'll catch the recording. Mm -hmm. She says, Hrishvalandi, this is an important conversation uh, relating to a rereading of the history of a space such as Cyprus. I wanted to ask whether you consider your work as part of post-colonial thought in the Mediterranean. Is the subaltern speaking through these songs? Also, uh, she regrets that she has to leave. She has already left. But uh, maybe if you can answer. Well, I uh, I think I, I have already uh, made a point that yes. in some of these songs, um, we see the subaltern uh, speak and humiliate, defeat, uh, even slaughter uh, mm -hmm. the representatives of, um, of the central authority, mm -hmm. uh, the king, the emperor, the, the nobility, so forth. Uh, this is a symbolic, uh, <laughs> a symbolic kind of uh, victory uh, over them. Perhaps the only they could have in the Middle Ages. Thank you. Let me pass uh, the uh, hosting to Lambros and Maria to take over for the for the conversation uh, question and answer section. Thank you, Valandi, for for being with us. This was Chris Valandi Skiriago, a historian of Byzantine and post Byzantine Cyprus, and a fellow of the Bank of Cyprus uh, Cultural Foundation. Thank you, Luis. Thank you so much uh, from myself also, so Alandi. Uh, super interesting. Uh, I would like to tell the audience um, to raise their hands if they want to ask a question or write them down. Um, but if there is not a question now, I, oh, Maria. Maria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. That was uh, uh, so interesting in so many aspects. Um, first of all, I have to say that my grandfather comes from Anamur. So it was very interesting to, to hear about the, uh, the song that was uh, transferred. Um, um, I wanted to make a, a point and a question. Um, uh, I think it's very interesting that at the same time we had this kind of language from elites that is very pompous and very rhetoric and um, full of uh, allegories and so on. And then we have this different language of the subaltern as you um, described it. So it's 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 a it's a chasm between the two two languages, and I think it's very interesting. Um, also, I, in relation to this, I wanted to ask how these um, um, the songs have been uh, recorded. Did the elite intervene? How they were uh, perceived? The, um, the second question I wanted to make was in relation to the good guys and the bad guys. So one of the things I found in, uh, in my thesis was that um, there is a third role, which is the role of the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I wanted to, to ask whether we could say, for example, that the Latins were not the bad guys, maybe they were the ugly guys, or I don't know, that does, um, is this, have you found this scheme of roles anywhere, like something in between of the bad and the good guy? Uh, I, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think, yes, the, there are ugly guys uh, in, <laughs> in the song. Uh, there is a version of the Viennese song. Um, the Viennese wants to steal uh, the daughter of, uh, of the king 
and um, he uh, uses um, the help of uh, a group of gypsies. Um, he eventually steals uh, steals the girl, and uh, he um, he leaves. Um, in that story, you have uh, an anti-hero who is ironically uh, the, the, the positive um, figure in the story, the Yanis, stealing uh, the daughter of uh, the king. You have um, the bad guys, the king, trying to stop the Yanis, and you have uh, this group in between who are the gypsies. And this could be <laughs> described as the ugly, um, uh, the ugly fellows, uh, because although the Yanis uh, uses their help and eventually um, succeeds in snatching the girl uh, through magic uh, taught to them by one of the gypsies, uh, he does not accept the gypsies as uh, a sequel. A sequel. Uh, he uh, shows them contempt, and this again um, reflects um, a point made earlier by Loizos that uh, although um, they. The songs recognize, acknowledge the proximity uh, to another group. This does not always mean that um, there is a blurring of, uh, of identities. So I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember the, the first uh, question. Um, I was asking whether the elites um, recorded this. Uh, oh, okay, yes, 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 yes. They have been in the recording of the songs. Uh, by me, by, by elites, do you mean um, educated um, teachers or folklorists or uh, scholars? Uh, well, in uh, to be able to be able to trace uh, examples from Cyprus, that requires a very systematic uh, kind of uh, of research, with which I. I uh, I haven't done, but in, uh, in, in Greece, of course, we have many examples of uh, um, the people recording the songs changing through changing uh, verses, so as to emphasize the national identity of, uh, of the heroes and the continuation of uh, uh, Greek culture and so forth. Uh, but I, I haven't I haven't noticed that in in Cyprus, in the Cypriot songs. We we, we we all it's interesting because in uh, one of the collections I have studied the Magda Kitromilidu collection, we have um, performers of the songs who are Turkish Cypriots. Uh, two Turkish Cypriots uh, in prison in prison. Uh, who who were singing a song about the Yanis. Uh, this is interesting. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Valandi, for the answer, and thank you, Maria, for uh, the question. Um, I'll pass the floor on to Jan now. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, interesting dialogue. Uh, I just want to ask if you know anything about the space where these songs were being recited and listened to. I mean, this might help us to maybe contextualize them a bit uh, better. Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we, we know almost nothing about um, the transmission of these songs in the medieval period or even not Ottoman times, but from comparative studies, um, we know that uh, these songs in the early 20th century uh, in 
mainland Greece, for example, were sung during weddings um, or, or during uh, panegyria, uh, religious feasts. Uh, and I think that something similar might have, might have happened in Cyprus. And the reason for singing these songs in uh, the panegyria or in uh, weddings was their um, function as initiatory uh, scenarios. Uh, they, so they, 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 they provided, they provided um, a roadmap uh, to uh, to the community and especially to those being involved in the ritual, um, coming of age rituals, rituals of uh, birth and death and so forth, uh, so as to be prepared for uh, what will happen later in, in life uh, or even for the end of life, death. So uh, for example, we know that uh, in weddings, people also used to sing uh, mirologia, ritual laments, to express the, uh, the grief of separation of uh, a young girl to, uh, from, from her family. Uh, there is also the, this um, element of uh, macho brutality um, embodied by the hero who is also, uh, who is always snatching uh, the brides of others or the daughters of others. And um, it might be shocking, but rape is uh, often described as if it's something um, positive or not to say positive, but uh, acceptable uh, for society. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, um, for this question and the answer. Uh, guys, um, uh, going into Lata for his next question. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you again. I, I just wanted to uh, express it, the, how interesting I found the fact that uh, the musicians were actually um, uh, the, yeah, like humiliating the authorities again, like parallelisms with today. But I also had the impression that, um, I don't know, that, like music was sort of always owned or it belonged to the elites. And I found this uh, very interesting, uh, I don't know, observation, I would say. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, yeah, if you have any say on this, but also I wanted to uh, ask about, um, like, as someone that is studying Byzantine history, and it's like a, quite a long time ago, how do we, what do we know about their identities? How did people identify themselves? You mentioned that they were uh, Romei, Romei. Um, how do we know about this? And yeah, how do historians talk about their identities? Is it possible to do it? Is it not? Well, huge, huge questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, well, we know that the lower classes uh, had their um, own singing tradition, and there, there, there were wandering uh, singers, but there were also professional singers singing at the court or uh, in the circle of, uh, of an aristocrat, a noble, but there were also low level uh, singers and uh, the songs were transmitted uh, by mouth, generation after generation, and if something um, is transmitted by mouth orally, uh, then uh, you cannot actually control it. Um, this is a problem. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, identities. Um, we explore identities by looking at primary sources, 
literature, hagiography, uh, historiography, uh, archaeology, uh, icons, frescoes, and so forth. Uh, the uh, quick answer to the, the one line answer to, to the question of identities <laughs> is that there are no single identities. There are multiple layers of identity. So if you are Orthodox in Cyprus, you could, could identify yourself with, uh, usually identify yourself with uh, the Romania, the Byzantine Empire of, uh, of the East. You feel, uh, you describe yourself as a Romeos, but you also might be uh, originating from, from Syria. You might be a Syrian, Syrian Orthodox. Uh, you speak Greek, uh, and there are levels of Greek language, uh, but you may also be speaking Arabic if you are a Syrian. And uh, uh, family uh, status, social status, profession, all these form different identities. Um, the layers of identity change according to particular contexts and uh, circumstances. Thank you, Chrisavala. Thank you very, very much. Um, there's another question by Okchan. Yeah, second question. It's a, it's a little one. So you mentioned that the language in these folk songs, I mean, change over the time. Of course, it's the case. But what about the, let's say, the regional linguistic differences? I mean, can you identify, for example, songs from Bafos to Rizzo Carpos? I mean, are they different? Is it possible to identify? Or maybe even, let's say, I mean, since you mentioned this uh, prison songs, Turkey Cypriots, can you identify maybe, of course, in later periods, uh, these not regional, but ethnic differences mm -hmm. in these songs? I mean, there is in Cyprus a sizable Greek-speaking Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Actually, even in Anamur, I'm not sure if you know, but there are Greek-speaking Cypriot villages in Anamur until 1960s. Mm -hmm. These are the population like movements from Cyprus to the Mediterranean coasts. Then again, I mean, do we see, or is it possible, like, have you ever checked these songs? I mean, because as far as I know, at least some of them were documented. Starting from 1950s, you have these ethnographic studies, for example. Uh, like, can we see these regional or ethnic differences uh, in these songs? Uh, yes, we have uh, regional varieties reflected uh, in the songs. For example, songs uh, recorded in Paphos. Um, the thing with the heroic folk songs I studied uh, is that their, their content is mostly medieval, which means that uh, they stop being enriched or developed um, after the late 16th century. We have, of course, a uh, great many uh, folk songs uh, produced during the period of Ottoman uh, rule in Cyprus and later under, uh, under the British, uh, which shed light on the, relation, the, the relations between uh, Muslims and Christians and so forth. Um, but it, in what concerns the, uh, the heroic folk songs, um, we have very few references to, uh, to Turks. And the Turk is always uh, the other, the enemy that will come uh, from outside Cyprus to uh, conquer Cyprus. We have references to uh, the Sultan Selim. This is why I argue that these songs stop being developed after the late uh, 16th century. And there is one exception. Uh, this exception is um, a song about uh, a Syrian lady uh, who is of the Latin uh, of the Latin faith, and um, 
she's married to a landlord in Siliku, mountainous uh, Limassol. Okay, and uh, the hero of the uh, of the song, uh, who prays to Saint George to help him snatch, steal the uh, uh, steal Zografu, uh, this Syrian lady, is called uh, Chicheklis. So I think uh, the name is uh, the name is Turkish. Um, uh, this is the only exception. And it seems to be a later adaptation of uh, a narrative, uh, this narrative of uh, the hero going to steal uh, and bright and so forth. Uh, going back to the medieval period. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Eloisius has a question. Unless anyone else has a question first. Um, I mean, the one thing we didn't get to talk about is the pre-Christian kind of mythology that goes into the into these um, these songs. And so, uh, can you kind of uh, sort of summarize the, the kind of importance of this pre-Christian um, corpus of of myths? Uh, well. Uh... I don't know from where to begin, and uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, the mythical structure, the mythical core of uh, of the songs is almost always pre-Christian. Mm. There is almost in every case a pre-Christian uh, parallel, uh, either Greek. Uh, going back to the Greek mythology or from Near Eastern Jewish uh, Mesopotamian uh, traditions. Um, but these narrative structures uh, go on and on and uh, the external shell, uh, the clothes change, uh, which is the language change, uh, but the, uh, the story remains more or less uh, the same. We also have mythical elements, uh, supernatural elements. Um, the demons become uh, giant snakes, monsters, uh, uh, fairy ladies, um, dragons, and so forth. And uh, let me read very quickly a list of toponyms from Cyprus, uh, which shows how, I mean, people believe the existence uh, of uh, this uh, supernatural uh, creatures. Um, place, names, uh, place names offer a panorama of pre-Christian cultural layers reutilized and reinterpreted in later periods. Famis near Kilanin denotes the mountainous cult of Zeus Ephemios. Mutituthkia, the peak of Zeus, suggests a similar cult in Fasula. Batimandarakli, the footstep of Heracles, is a common toponym in Marathasa, Akamas, in Papuza. Araklia, Arakli, is another Herculean toponym found in Rizogarpas of Dionysus. Dionysus is encountered near the village of Lanya. The Monovuni, mountain of demons, and the Monostase, standing place of demons, are to be found in Plataniscia and Salamis. Dracondas and Mutitu Draconda, Dracon's Peak, are toponyms in Rizogarpaso. Dracondorotsus, Dracon's Rock, exists near Polemi. Dracondia, Dracon's Plains, uh, place in Saint Therapon. Dracondospigios, Dracon's Cave, in Sculi. Dracondotripa, dragon's hold in Peya, and Pagiomata to Dracondos, a fighting place of dragons in Pyrgos. Spigios is Lamnias. Lamnia is a mythical creature, uh, half uh, woman, half demon, half snake. Um, Lamnias cave in Colossi. 
and the list just goes on. Well, it's it sounds like all of these, it, it you know, it, they they the function of like this um, sort of the, the myth element to these songs is that they uh, they kind of reach the deepest uh, parts of the psyche of the the peasant population. It's uh, it it feels like they kind of reach where you know just language can't necessarily uh, get I, I i read an ethnographic account about uh super super superstitions mm. uh, some time ago some time ago and uh there was one uh entry on uh the murderer used to leak off the blood from the knife he had used to kill someone because he believed that he would take the strength of um, the man he had killed. I mean, these things are pagan, are, are certainly, not, <laughs> certainly not Christian. Mm. Um, but you see how the mentalities of people, peasant mm. societies, um, continue to be, a, to be attached onto this, uh, to what they know. So this is also like a world in which magic kind of still exists. Like it's it's there. It's part of life almost. To yes, my magic overlaps with uh, with the reality. Mm. <laughs> it's part of reality. Even though, kind of the, the you know during Christian times, there was an effort to kind of put an end to to all of that um, corpus of. Uh, sort of superstitions and um, sort of belief in magic. Yes, yes, uh, that's true. But again, you have peasant priests slaughtering uh, chicken or cocks uh, mm. times of drought uh, to mm. bring down uh, rain. Mm. Uh, you have you have this kind of. Stuff. Again, it, it goes against everything, like uh, the way we, we kind of imagine Cypriot society um, uh, the same as the kind of image of Aphrodite that is kind of sanitized at some point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there is a, a, a kind of difference there that uh, <laughs> this, this work kind of brings to light. Huh? Yeah, but I, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. Uh, I mean, I, I was surprised to find this this different world uh, while doing the research for uh, for the book. Uh, Thanks. Thank you so much. Maya, do you want to uh, take over? Yeah, um, thank you very much both. Um, I would like to ask one last time if there are any questions. Uh, please feel free to either post them on the chat or raise your hands or forever hold your peace. Okay, dead silent it is. Uh, okay, <laughs> so um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Valandi Kiriakou, for um, a very stimulating um, presentation. Uh, thank you to our own Loisos Kapsalis. Uh, for uh, his very interesting questions and uh, keeping the discussion going. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us and asking your questions and um, uh, supporting Barches one more time. Um, and please feel free to, you know, something called social media. Uh, make sure to follow, like, subscribe, um, whatever it is you want to do. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and the live event on Facebook, but you're more than welcome to stay um, if you want to continue this discussion on a more private um, way. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.